All right, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, this is our gallery talk for our current exhibition, A Movable Feast. From a while back, we were coming up with ideas for an exhibition, and all of us here at the gallery like the idea of building a show around Ernest Hemingway's Paris Memoirs, A Movable Feast. Uh, we thought it would be perfect for spring and perfect for a group show with artists who work in different styles responding to the themes in Hemingway's book. So that's what we have currently on display. And typically we have um, an artist talk for a show, but with this exhibition we have five artists participating, so we thought we wanted to do something different, maybe a, um, a presentation about food and art. Um, and so right away, Shawnee Kelly came to mind. Um, Shawnee is, what do you would call a Renaissance woman? Um, she is an educator, um, an author, and an entrepreneur. Um, she is co-owner of Wonderlust Tours, uh, which hosts trips abroad and here in the States um, that are not only fun, but also informative. Um, they specialize in educational, well, they specialize in historical, cultural, and culinary travel. Um, she also teaches at Upper Arlington's Lifelong Learning Program, where she's taught for over 10 years. Um, she teaches travel seminars there and cooking classes. Um, she also teaches cooking classes at the Season Forum House, um, and she writes for Edible Columbus, um, and she also has um, written several books. Um, her most recent book is Discover Cape Cod. Um, she has a book coming out in the fall called A Woman's Guide to France. Um, she's also written um, Insiders Columbus, and she is currently working on a book called Kissing in the Kitchen. <laughs> uh, but she also has she also has a background in art history, so we thought, of course, she would be perfect for this. Um, and so she's going to give us a little overview of um, food throughout history and art. Um, I think with uh, some highlights going back to the Renaissance. And also participating in today's event is uh, Julia Boyd. Um, Julia is the pastry chef at Elena's Food and Wine. We are very thrilled that she's able to participate with this with this event. Um, she came in and saw the work on display and created some bites that are inspired by the work um, by these artists. And I saw a, um, a hot pink terrine um, <laughs> inspired by Sarah Fairchild. So um, we have the artistry of Julia Boyd on display today also. And then she will get the, um, the, the bites will be out um, after the presentation. So once again, thank you for coming. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Shawnee. Thank you. I really um, appreciated being asked to speak for a talk like this because it brings together everything that I love both uh, professionally and personally, which is food, number one, travel, and art. And when I can combine everything into one talk, we're going to pack a lot into, I promise to keep it 40 minutes, um, maybe 30 if uh, we hustle. So when I came into uh, the gallery to speak with Marlena and Chet and the, the crew here, uh, we were brainstorming some ideas about how to um, approach such a daunting, huge topic such as food and art. I mean, food and art goes all the way back to the Egyptian days, and we're not going that far back. Um, we, were, we decided, since this is the 21st century and this is a contemporary art gallery, that I would start in the 21st century. Where I was going to go back to was left to be determined um, because my background is actually in art architectural history and um, I have this mad passion for medieval sculpture from 12th century cathedrals. And I thought, okay, are we going to go all the way back to the medieval days? But we are not. We are going to stop at the Renaissance because as soon as I saw this image, which I hope you can all see, um, this is the cover of a friend of mine's cookbook. He's a vegetarian, and when I saw this come up on, uh, I think it was either his Instagram or Facebook feed, I was like, you are completely inspired by this Renaissance artist named Jack, uh, Giuseppe Archimbaldo. I don't know who, who's familiar with that name here, uh, but he was a 16th century painter that just made these crazy kooky portraits of faces uh, from food and flora and fauna, and I'm going to show you some images, which the uh, very first few images in my slideshow are a little dark, so we might be wrangling with the lighting in here, but I'll point out what you need to see, uh, hopefully. Um, but with that said, I emailed uh, Martin here, and I said, you've been looking at Archimbaldo, haven't you? 
this is your inspiration for your cookbook cover? And he said, yes, and Peter Gabriel's sledgehammer video. And I thought, okay, how do we manage that? Because, I mean, I'm a, I'm a child of the 80s, and I totally love that song, but I could not remember the video having any food connotations. I remember his face flickering and, you know, black and white and claymation, but here, Peter Gabriel actually turns into a bowl of fruit, like a fruit face. I haven't talked to Peter lately to see what his inspiration was for uh, his fruit face in the video, but I just thought it was such an interesting coming together of um, 20th century pop culture, 21st century food culture, and a Renaissance painter, and I thought that's how I'm going to bridge the gap between looking at contemporary food and art, and then how am I going to wrap it into a talk uh, going as far back as the Renaissance. I don't know if you guys can see this very clearly, but this is a Giuseppe Archimbaldo on the right. And he lived in the 16 or 1520s. So he was right at the peak of the Renaissance period. Archimbaldo was an Italian artist who really made his, his name uh, painting traditional religious scenes. And he contributed a lot by way, whoops, sorry, a little trigger happy here. Um, he really contributed to uh, the uh, artworks in the Milan Cathedral. But what he really excelled at doing were these crazy, kooky portraits uh, made from all sorts of fruit and vegetables, flora, fauna, and he did entire series. Uh, the Four Seasons, he made faces out of uh, ingredients or, or products or produce that were, you know, from the summer, spring, winter, fall. And he also made this uh, series called The Four Elements. And in this case, um, this is actually a face made up of uh, sea creatures. There is a stingray coming right up the side of the cheekbone. There's pearls that came from the sea. This image represents water. Back in the medieval days, actually as far back as, you know, antiquity, and all the way up through the Renaissance, it was believed that the universe and your being were created from four elements water, air, earth, and fire. These also translated into your body as the four humors and the four temperaments. Whether you're phlegmatic or sanguine or if you're happy or sad, it's because you have one uh, or more of these elements prevalent in your body. Um, that played into so much of the food culture, actually, in the medieval days and the Renaissance period. And <clears throat> it was believed that if you ate you know, a lot of fish, you drew this kind of water element into your body. If you ate a lot of fowl, which this is air, anything that came out of the air. Um, if anybody wants to see any of these images after, I have them very clearly and bright on my laptop and I'm happy to show you. But um, these are birds and uh, more birds and peacocks apparently right down here. Um, anything that came from the air, not only birds, but nuts that are hanging from the tree were considered something from the air. Um, you ate that, you took in these air elements into your body. There was a hierarchy in the way people were allowed to hunt and uh, acquire food based on your rank in society and also um, played to these four elements. And I can explain this by saying, if you were the lord or the lady or the nobility that owned the land, you were allowed to hunt, fish, pick the ripest fruit off the tree. You were allowed to, um, you know, hunt a deer or a boar and you'd have the freshest meat. If you were the peasant working the land, you could only take the nuts, the chestnuts that dropped off the tree. You might be able to pick up the rabbit that died on the side of the stream. You were not allowed to hunt or fish, but you were allowed to pull roots from the ground. So that's where this huge divide in the way they ate came to be. The nobility had fire in their uh, dining rituals. They were able to have kitchen staff, big kitchens. They were able to cook the meat that they were allowed to hunt. Um, they were able to afford spices. 
He is not made up of food. He is actually made up of cannons, weapons, his hair's on fire. This is a statement to the kind of the tumultuous society that um, Italy was in the early 15 and mid 1500s. Um, but it also spoke to the fact that if you were wealthy, you had the ability to preserve your food so you could have well-cooked food later on. You were able to use fire because you might have had multiple kitchens, people cooking your food for you. And the way I like to say it is the poor people or the peasants that didn't have this luxury were forced to be vegetarians by necessity. Um, quite, that's where you have this huge divide in that fabulous peasant food that you can get in northern Italy. Um, you have lots of nuts and lots of cheese and herbs uh, integrated into your pasta. It was just really um, true peasant food was vegetarian. And um, <clears throat> completely different class, but vegetarianism in the eyes of the Catholic Church back then was actually considered, it was illegal. You weren't allowed to be a vegetarian. You had to eat some meat. So incorporating meat into your diet was a very uh, challenging thing if you were poor. I promised I wasn't going to get into the medieval days in this talk, aside from one slide. I put this slide up here uh, because this is, um, this speaks to my experiences when I lived in England for a few years working for English Heritage. And this is when I discovered food in sculpture. And I don't think I realized what an impact it had on me at the time. Um, I only realized this maybe five, six, seven years ago when I found that you know, food works its way into everything that I do. But um, when I was doing research for English Heritage, I had access to this warehouse with 10,000 sculptures from throughout uh, northern England. They dated from 10th century through maybe the 15th century. And I focused on a collection of religious sculptures from this particular type of abbey. Many of them came from Revo Abbey. I spent a lot of time digging around archives and the actual site <clears throat> looking for ways to contextualize where these various pieces of rubble and ruin came from. This monastery was supposed to be a very austere, plain, simple monastery. And I'm like, oh, this sculpture is, was painted. This sculpture has images of monks doing their industrious work, whatever that is. The monks are you know, carving images of themselves making beer, images of them uh, wheeling their wheat off to be ground at the local mill. So then I started realizing, oh, these, all of these little you know, images of food is a commentary. It's a sculptural commentary to um, their, like the cultural uh, environment of their time. And so I started paying attention to little things like, oh, they're carrying a bag of wheat on a donkey. Why is that? because they were taking their wheat to the weekly market over here. And so this started to make me view, uh, started to make me look at artworks a little closer, and I would zero in on food, and I still do, actually. So these are just like uh, the refectory where the monks ate, and a lot of these uh, sculptures came from not the area where the monks would eat, but the areas below where uh, the workers would actually make the food and there was storage. So images of uh, local uh, fruits and vegetables were carved. So there was definitely sculpture in an abbey where it should not have been. And it was during this time that I started looking at historic like herb gardens and kitchen gardens and medicinal gardens and seeing how these uh, medieval people cooked and what they cooked. And I, at that point, I became fascinated with historic recipes. And um, actually, Julia and I have recently taught a class about the uh, kitchen in an English castle. So we recreated some historic recipes, and I talked about all these experiences and castles. And, um, but I, one of the things that sat well with me at this point was that 
my, my entire life, actually this is getting a little philosophical, but my entire life started to change when I was living in England because I would eat differently, I would shop differently. When your refrigerator is only two feet tall, you can't go to Sam's Club or Costco and stock up. You have to shop on a daily basis. And so I started thinking about how this, this lifestyle has been ingrained in Europeans particularly, but you know, in these people all the way back for a thousand years. Um, <clears throat> and this is actually a quote, hunger is a, good, hunger is a good discipline. And I thought that would be appropriate to slide in, that's from uh, Movable Feast, it would be appropriate to slide in here where monks were actually, um, you know, uh, I guess some of these abbeys were very wealthy, they ate well, so they may not have been hungry, but I would say that vows of poverty and chastity is a good discipline too. But either way, um, that is where my, that is where my uh, love of uh, food and art came to be. Now one of these images um, I showed in uh, our cooking class, the castle class, the uh, kitchen in a castle class, and it's a very basic image. This is an early Renaissance uh, uh, painting of Saint Anne giving birth to the Virgin Mary. So basically, this is Jesus' grandma in her bed after she just had a baby. And it looks like a very normal, uh, everyday maternal scene until you start seeing little symbolism of rabbits. They just had a baby. Uh, here's... here's um, uh, the Virgin Mary, but you also see this woman over here handing a bowl of something to Anne. That something is Bianco Mangiare. The Bianco Mangiare translates to white food. And when I saw this painting and just realized, I asked, what is that? What's in the bowl? And I was told it's Blanc Mange in French, Bianco Mangiare in Italian. I'm like, ooh, what is this? You know, and they said, well, it is a restorative that was fed to sick people, women who just gave birth. Um, it was pretty much, loosely speaking, a porridge of almond milk and occasionally chicken or fish and some sugar. And I said, that does not sound delicious. But <laughs> when you think about the, the contemporary version of Blanc Mange, which Julia made the most sublime version of. I had four of them for breakfast, the leftovers. Um, this ended up being the Blanc Mange or the Bianco Mangiare was translated somehow loosely into every European <clears throat> culture. This is your true very first international dish. And it turns up in art quite frequently. If you see somebody in the medieval days eating a bowl and it looks like it's white, Likely, it's this blanc mange. And we were talking about how um, this day and age, our lives are easy. Blanc mange has turned into sort of a panna cotta, or it's like a cross between a panna cotta and a mousse. And it's beautiful, it's sugary, it's almondy, it's dessert. But you also have, you know, gelatin in a box that you can put into it and kind of firm it up. Back in uh, the old days, they had to incorporate fish or chicken because the gelatin that cooked out of the meats helped bring it all together into almost like a gelatinous bowl of restorative deliciousness. Um, so, you know, I guess even <laughs> Jesus' grandma needed restored too. So anyway, blanc mange is, uh, turns up quite often as the Renaissance comfort food is what I refer to it as but I prefer to consider it a uh, contemporary dessert, which is delicious. When I worked for English Heritage, which is the organization that oversees uh, and, and, and protects most of the historic properties in England, um, I had access to every property in the country for two years. So even when I wasn't doing research, I was doing research. And my sense of history back then kind of stopped right around Henry Tudor, the Henry saga. And um, I thought, oh, I don't want to go to Hampton Court. It's just so modern. I like my old medieval rubble and ruin. So one day I got roped into going to Hampton Court. And I was like, oh, this place is amazing. 
Hampton Court, the kitchens were glorious, unbelievable. Have, I, you're shaking yeah. your head. Have, have you guys been there, some of you? It's unbelievable to see these kitchens that serve 600 people at minimum twice a day. What they cranked out of these kitchens was crazy. Um, they had storage with like 400 gallons of wine um, somewhere in the castle. And when I went into the kitchens, they were doing this reenactment of uh, this big uh, event that was going on during the time of Henry VIII. I spotted these little pies. They looked like modern uh, pasties or just English pocket pies and asked about them. And they're like, oh, these, you know, these pies have been around since the Tudor times. This was actually a specific pie that they called chewets. And fast forward 100 years or so, the chewets became these incredible works of art. The puff pastry that you could take the lid off and there were little mini pastries inside or they would let the birds you know, fly out of them. Um, <laughs> these Tudor chewets were the precursor to the modern day English pie, like the meat pies or the kidney pies that you can get. Um, the little chewets in, that look like they're probably about hand size were made, and you can see these in paintings, were made initially for Henry VIII's um, ninth or 10th birthday before he actually became king. Apparently a gigantic tureen of soup, bisque of some sort was brought in. And you know how you lap soup from a spoon or from a little cup back then. They would float these chewets on top, these little pies, and they say, you don't slurp that, you chew it. So that's how the name chew it stuck. And you'll often see paintings that say something, you know, partridge and chew it. And that to me was always a question like, well, what's a chew it? Um, and I learned that in the kitchen at Hampton Court. And I'm very happy that I actually gave in and went. Um, it was during Henry VIII's reign in England, which was early 1500s. Uh, that the Renaissance was unfolding in the rest of uh, Europe. It was already full-blown in Italy, working its way north uh, into the Netherlands with all the Dutch painters. Um, and it was also during this time, there was a lot of exchange of ideas. Cultural and culinary um, exchanges happened because of wars between France and Italy, wars between France and England. Uh, there were Mongol invasions that had happened, you know, over 200 years. So the Silk Road was open to the West. So all of these um, exotic spices like saffron, nutmeg, and cinnamon were finding their way into the Tudor, uh, Tudor kitchens. And at this point in time, the kitchens at Hampton Court were probably the most globally inspired kitchens in the world. And when you look at their, when you look at these old cookbooks, it's unbelievable to see, they ate everything. If it moved, they ate it. Everything from like swans to uh, whatever beast in the field. Um, and they made, and they made such pageantry of it. Henry VIII's uh, birthday pie was actually a peacock pie made of peacock, um, peacock meat. And the peacock itself was taxidermed and put on top. So he was the lid to the actual pie. Um, this was a time, too, where um, that whole idea of hierarchy in, eaten, in eating and having your meals came from divine intervention. You had the God-given right to eat first. So um, the king ate, then everybody ate. Um, and apparently, there's a, there's a saying about Henry VIII that said he was a great consumer of food and women. And this is the truth. So anyway, this still life um, is actually about, painted about, I don't know, 80 years after Henry VIII. But this shows the direction of painting in the Renaissance. Uh, much more naturalism, uh, actually looking at lemons and painting lemons, actually setting up still lives and painting from real life was the way that art was going in the times of uh, Henry VIII and the early Renaissance. Oops, we'll go that way. Um, 
I put this picture up even though it is from a uh, earlier uh, medieval manuscript. But again, the rich would eat meat on a spit. They would have limitless seafood, sugary stuff. Um, the poor would eat what was called a potage in French or a pottage, which eventually became porridge. But it is really just a stew of whatever you could get out of the ground, if it was cabbage and onions. Uh, and barley and oats. Uh, that was the poor person's food. But the pottage was definitely a dish that, like the Bianco Mangiare, straddled both the wealthy and the poor world. Um, if you had a little leftover peacock or swan, you got the fancy part. You got the fancy uh, pottage. Throw in some saffron. Feed it to the king. You know, it's not a poor dish when you add saffron. So this image is really. Um, a picture of Esau, who's an Old Testament Bible character. I think he kind of looks like uh, Joaquin Phoenix a little bit. Um, eating some, some pottage or potage is what I tend to call it with a rabbit that probably didn't make it into the stew at this point. So my point for putting this picture in is that right around the time of, say, 1550s, mid 16th century, food started finding its way into imagery, whether it was uh, a wealthy feast or just a poor man eating his, his pottage. Uh, food became a, pre a prevalent theme, and I even think it's, sh it should be its own genre of art, food art. During um, the 15th and 16th century, a few technological developments happened in the whole the world of art. One was the development and the use of um, oil painting as opposed to tempera painting, which I wanted to make one comment about tempera and fresco. Prior to the 1500s, oil painting did not really exist in the Western world. Oils. The oils from seeds were used in some uh, Asian countries, uh, like in Chinese art, way back to like the fourth, fifth, sixth century. But it was never really common or heard of in our uh, Western culture until uh, the Dutch started to uh, experiment with a variety of seed oils. Prior to that, frescoes were incredibly popular medium to paint in. If you've been to Italy, You've probably seen some really beautiful frescoes if you've been to some of the uh, chapels in northern Italy and Tuscany. Uh, fresco is basically using food, in my mind, using food to paint. You have pigments ground down into a powder and then mixed with some sort of binder, which ended up being egg yolk most of the time. So when you think they mixed like, you know, dirt and egg yolk and painted these masterpieces in chapels, it's unbelievable to think how this lasted for 700 years, or not, but um, the, the introduction of oil paints changed the face of painting, it changed the style, it went in this direction of um, realism, you could get a depth of painting, uh, perspective, the idea of three-dimensional perspective was evolving around this time frame. So, this painting is actually at the Columbus Museum of Art. Uh, it was When I first moved here in 97, the first thing I did was go to the museum, and I was drawn, amongst other art, artwork, I was drawn to this uh, because it, it was really over the top, and at that point I hadn't, uh, I hadn't gone back to school yet for art history. I just always loved art, but I was always drawn to this painting, so I thought I'd include it. Um, the great Dutch masters in the Baroque period, they absolutely mastered the use of oils. Uh, they were able to capture reflections. They were able to capture texture. That's pretty much what you wanted to showcase your patrons' uh, earthly goods. Their fabulous you know, musical instruments, their great taste in lobster and lemons, and their ability to get their hands on oysters. Oysters were all the rage back then, still are. Um, so you have this uh, 
painting that just puts all of your, you know, your culinary and cultural uh, cards on the table, literally. But it's also a reminder that all of your earthly goods are fleeting, and this is all going to be gone. So there were these, still these like religious and moralizing undertones uh, clinging to these artworks, saying, you know, you may be the richest guy in town, but someday you'll be food for worms, just like the rest of us. So um, every so often a skull made it onto the table or into the food mix. It's like, oh, what's a skull doing in the middle of like the partridge pie? But that was a reminder that, you, you know, your partridge pie is fleeting, your skull is not. <laughs> so I like to uh, put this image in. This is uh, a late Baroque uh, picture, a scene from a market, a market woman just showing off all the goods. You could see everything from chickens to grapes to, I'm trying to even see what that is, a couple rabbits. You know, so you get a sense of how, I mean, how fresh and how accessible uh, real food was because there was no way to store it. Um, as time passed and, you know, the whole, the Renaissance set in, um, there was still a hierarchy in your eating, uh, in your eating world. But at this point, getting your hands on food was a little easier. There was a little bit more of that middle, uh, the middle class. People could actually afford to go to a market and shop and uh, eat food. So uh, this is just a, a statement to the market culture in the uh, late 1600s, the 17th century. This uh, artist is uh, Jan van Steen. He was infamous for, for uh, painting these really bawdy kitchen scenes. And um, this is the entire family drinking and smoking and carousing in front of the kids. And so the whole point of this uh, painting is to say, your kids will learn from your behavior. So don't do this. And, you know, pouring wine. And so and you see the little kids over on the edge, if you can. Uh, taking a puff off the pipe, and the, it's called the, the, the piper. If, you, if, you, if they hear it, they will sing it, is the name of this, uh, I think the formal name of this painting. Just saying that um, your actions impact their actions, and they will likely do what you do. So don't drink and smoke in your kitchen in front of them. You can start to see this transition in uh, art in general, but especially in the Dutch and the Flemish paintings during the 17th century. Uh, Vermeer is famous for painting the girl with the pearl earring. He was also very famous for painting domestic interiors. You can see a lot of food, a lot of uh, kitchen scenes in his artwork. They're beautiful. He's a master of light and shadow, um, simplicity, reign supreme in his, uh, in his compositions. Uh, but this one is called The Milkmaid, and I love this painting. It's very peaceful and serene, and it's almost, it, it is the antithesis of what you see in the royal paintings of Henry VIII, where everybody's at this elaborate feast at a table, and here you have the one simple milkmaid just putting out the food. And um, I find a lot of serenity in, in Vermeer's artwork. And I thought another quote from uh, another quote from *Movable Feast*: uh, "For a poet, he threw a very accurate milk bottle." So, anyway, an appropriate picture, for, an appropriate quote for an appropriate picture. We're going to leap a little bit forward to the 18th century um, when. You think about, when I think about the 18th century, I think Marie Antoinette and Versailles, I think of revolutions, the Industrial Revolution, the American, the French Revolution, two very different ends of the spectrum when it comes to food, especially in art. Um, the French artists of this time period were just over the top. I call them my frou-frou Frenchy fête, uh, fête galants. Fête Galant just means the grand, gallant feast. There were lots of images of people having uh, 
picnics outdoors and all kinds of frivolous fets with friends and lovers. It was a very dreamy, um, unreal landscape. Um, lots of food, more from the, I guess, perspective of like grapes and wine, uh, very classically driven. You have a lot of sculptures of uh, gods and goddesses, so that's why there's a lot of grapes and wine uh, that turn up in these. But uh, Nicholas Lancre, he is a Rococo, one of the top three Rococo artists, um, and he was famous for propelling these ideas of hunting meals and hunting scenes uh, into French culture. So you go on a hunt, the servants drag your table, all your gear out into the middle of the field, and you just set up shop and party. The dogs get to lick the oyster uh, shells. And there's a lot of symbolism in this. The dogs, usually there's two dark dogs, one white dog uh, that represents certain uh, loyalty and lust. So there is all sorts of symbolism wrapped up in these fete galant and these hunting images. Uh, but I'm not going to go there right now. They're just um, incredibly festive. And this other image by Nicholas Lancre is called um, the Oyster Lunch. So clearly, these guys love the feast. They will feast in the dining room, and they will um, throw their oysters on the ground. This is actually uh, the very first documented painting with a bottle of champagne in it. So if you, if you look closely here, these two, these are bottles of champagne in a tub. And you can see it very clearly on my laptop, but um, that's why I wanted to include that image. But um, at the other end of the spectrum, during this time period, people were starving. And you had your extreme divide in France during this period where you had, you know, Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI living in Versailles, feeding you know, thousands of people on a daily basis. And then you have, if you've ever seen Les Mes, you know, someone steals a loaf of bread and they end up in jail for 20 years. Um, so there's this extreme uh, divide between the food cultures um, at this time. And in a way, food did sort of spawn the French Revolution, partly. Uh, the country was mostly bankrupt. But this image, I was trying to find an image of Marie Antoinette eating, but most of these paintings during this period are these royal paintings of them just sitting with their kids, looking, you know, royal. I thought the satire would be better. Um, this satire basically is showing Marie Antoinette is over here, and this gargantuan Louis the, uh, Louis the 16th her husband, after the French Revolution began in 1789, so this is two years after um, they were, uh, they were um, removed from the throne. What I like about this satire is they're showing them like these giant, massive, just greedy people at the table, and all the people of France are bringing them food. Wine bottles, they're wheeling, they're wheeling in uh, barrels and uh, bags of stuff to their table, and they're just eating, and here you have Marie Antoinette, and they're going, more, you know. So during this time period, there was a, at least at Versailles, there was a culture of anything goes. The tablescapes became tall, and the food became miniature. So it was a very busy table uh, setting at this point in time. You can, and I, I apologize for the quality of this, but this is um, a uh, illustration from the British Library. But these are um, like stacked trays. The, the three-tiered trays became very popular, and Marie Antoinette loved all her miniature desserts. So this is just kind of speaking to the massive table that they had, and also just little indications of her habits, where she loved little desserts, and they loved um, oxes he or, uh, pig's heads into the 19th century. I figure I didn't want to show you all kinds of pictures of starving French people because that's just not fun to look at. So we're just going to jump forward and we're going to go straight to Giverny. Um, yeah, because the French Revolution, all those images, they turned, what I was saying is there was actually 
uh, the two types of art were this very frivolous, fun, fete galants, and then there was also this neoclassical stuff where, you know, it was very, very just staunch and uh, not, not very pretty to look at from my, so it's my slideshow, so we're going to look at pretty stuff. Um, <laughs> So I figured we would move forward into sort of the Impressionist period. What I was trying to do is capture um, little snippets of each century. And I feel that the 19th century, nothing really captures it more than the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists. And there are two cookbooks out. Um, one is an older cookbook called Monet's Table. And a new one just came out like a couple weeks ago called Monet, Monet's Palette cookbook. And both books draw on not only Monet's own recipes, but they draw on uh, uh, ingredients that he had in his garden because he was the, um, he was the great gardener. He lived, has anyone been to Giverny, north of Paris? It's an extraordinary uh, little village. Basically, his house is about the only thing to go visit there. But he has these gardens, and Monet says that he became a painter because of his garden, because of gardens, basically. Um, but he was the ultimate foodie artist. And he actually would um, cook for his friends, for his artist friends that were Degas, and um, invited all kinds of people to Giverny, to his home, and he would go out to the garden, pick stuff, cook it for them, and then paint them eating. So I'm just like, I would love to get invited to a dinner like that where we go, you know, just start to finish. Talk about a renaissance, man. Um, but anyway, I believe he is the one that coined the word or the, the phrase that you eat with your eyes. It, 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 there's been phrases like that throughout history. But he's the one that really, I, I think, put that concept front and center with food and art. He said, you eat with your eyes. And so his entire house... Is, he's not afraid of color, as we all know well. Um, whoops, let's go here. But this one image um, are some of his friends in the background, a little picnic scene, uh, tea, bread he probably made, and uh, some of his gardens. But there's quite a few images of Monet uh, entertaining friends, maybe not with him necessarily in the picture, but uh, lots of images of uh, food and still lifes. And he, so I've clearly set the precedent for the Impressionists. And then there's Paul Cezanne, who, of course, we all love. Um, he took the Impressionist concept and ran with it. And the reason I wanted to include him here, too, is because everybody from Cezanne forward, like Matisse, they, he said, Cezanne is the father of us all. Cezanne um, just basically found innovative ways to take a still life and um, found new ways to mess with color and light and space and depth perception. And um, he has a zillion still lives of food out there. You could just, you know, Google Paul Cezanne, a still life will come up with apples usually. But um, this new cookbook also that just came out, Cezanne, not just, maybe two years ago, Cezanne and the Provencal Table, <coughs> speaks to his time and his experiences in Aix-en-Provence. He grew up in uh, southern France. He was born in Aix. His studio is there. You can visit it. It's exactly as he left it when he died. Skulls on the table and all. Um, he had a still life that he was painting with skulls and flowers. Um, and it's there. And... He was always influenced, not always, but he was influenced by that Provencal light, that southern French Mediterranean light that so many artists have uh, been drawn to through the, century, or through the decades. And so he really uh, tapped into the lighting that the, that the Impressionists all loved in the south of France. I learned to understand Cezanne much better and see truly how he made landscapes when I was hungry. I used to wonder if he were hungry too when he painted. But I thought it was possible only that he had forgotten to eat. It was one of those unsound but illuminating thoughts you have when you've been sleepless or hungry. And I think that speaks to Hemingway's approach to writing as well, where he was 
searching in very simple senses. We've all read Hemingway, and he is such a simplistic writer, but he can capture so much in just a few words and a few sentences. And I think that he always compared himself to Cezanne for the simple reason that he searched for a, a dimension in his writing the way Cezanne searched for dimension in simplicity of his landscapes and his still life. So I think those two are um, kin, you know, just kindred spirits in, in the art and writing world. And in the early 20th century, uh, Matisse came into the scene as one of the wild beast phobists. He loved color. Uh, Matisse is the one that said Cezanne is the father of us all. And in the early 20th century, you have the, you know, the onset of electricity, you have kitchen gadgets are starting to become popular, and you have this little uh, coffee maker that turns up in a lot of Matisse's early paintings. And he was fascinated with the simplicity of kitchen tools and caffeinated drinks. So you see a lot of coffee cups and tea kettles, and uh, his, his favorite coffee maker apparently uh, makes it through several phases of uh, Matisse's career. And that falls in line with the sculpture of the time, and uh, so many other painters were fascinated with the simplicity of everyday things. That's a different class. And again, Matisse, later in life, um, he went from this incredibly vibrant, colorful, phobist period um, through his modernism period where he inspired Cubists and Picasso, and uh, they, I'm sure they duked it out over ladies, who knows. Um, and then he went to Morocco and Northern Africa and started to get into this sort of primitivism. And you start to see his styles changing, and the older he becomes, he loses his sight, starts doing cutouts and, and uh, collages. So he never ever lost his, uh, his evolution until the very day. And Again, he was always, uh, there was always some sort of interior scenes, uh, food, the coffee pot, till the very end. This is um, the Matisse Museum. It's one of uh, the national museums. Well, actually, it is the National Museum of Matisse, and it's in Nice. And I lived in Nice for a year and spent quite a bit of time um, in this museum just milling about and became quite uh, smitten with Matisse. So if you're ever in Nice, make the trek up the hill to go see this uh, museum because it sits in the grounds of a uh, Roman amphitheater. So you get to see ancient Roman ruins right outside the back door of Matisse's house where his collection was. And he's actually buried out back. And while I am, uh, ta I was talking about cookbooks before, and I thought I would insert this right here, we're not going back to the medieval days, but I thought, did you ever wonder where all the unicorns have gone? I mean, I hadn't really thought about it until a few years ago when um, this image surfaced from the 14th century. Queen Philippa, who was the queen of England at the time, ordered unicorn's head on a platter. I'm just like, where did this come from? How do we not know about like this, this unicorn cookery book from the 14th century? <laughs> Taketh one unicorn, marinade in cloves and garlic, then roast on a griddle. I'm just like, oh my god, that poor unicorn is on a spit. Leave it to us humans to like eat unicorns out of existence, you know? I was like completely disappointed to learn this was an April Fool's joke by the British Library. They put this out uh, two years ago saying this, this unicorn cookbook surfaced. I and it, actually, when I looked at the date, it was April 1st. And I was like, oh, you got me, man. But I was disappointed to learn that it really didn't exist. But I was also relieved because we still don't know where the unicorns went. Um, that's all. I thought I'd just insert that right here. Because the next cookbook, we're going to step into the 20th century, um, is a real cookbook. And it's um, Mrs. Beaton's Everyday Cookery and Housekeeping Book. Now, we've all seen Downton Abbey, or at least we're all familiar with Downton Abbey, and the very uh, stringent um, eating, I guess, uh, eating uh, 
habits that they had. I didn't realize how stringent they were until I started reading through Mrs. Beaton's book. She has pages and pages and pages of the way you need to create certain jellies, the way you need to display your, your pies, your asparagus, whatever, um, holiday arrangements. It, the book's like this thick. And what I learned um, through, uh, through actually doing research for a cooking class, during the Edwardian era, just leading up to World War I, the motto of the nobility was that it's always sunny in England. Of course it's always sunny upstairs, not always sunny downstairs at Downton Abbey. Um, but what I also learned is they ate at least five times a day. They would have breakfast in the morning, they would have elevenses, which was sort of the 11 a.m. version of happy hour. They would eat lunch, then they would have high tea, and then they would take supper at six or seven, and dinner usually um, involved at least nine courses. They would start with the light course being seafood or soup, um, leading all the way up to um, maybe the fifth course is a nice palate cleansing bread pudding, and then you launch into your heavier uh, beef and, and meat dishes. But then came World War I, and it was not sunny in England at all. Uh, the entire culinary culture changed. Not only did most of the wait staff and lots of um, you know, agricultural workers were sent off to war, the upstairs had to learn to fend for themselves and rations were put into place for food. And so the entire eating uh, world was turned on its head. So some of the Edwardian pictures show all the happy aristocrats you know, at their table, but then, oh here I wanted to put in some more pictures from Mrs. Beaton's, the appropriate, um, the appropriate dinnerware for certain holidays, the, um, what does that say on there? The roast partridge, the partridges in lard are very different, roast fowls. So anyway, there was this very strict etiquette that eventually just went, went away. Um, because in World War I, like I was saying, so much of the agricultural uh, workers the general labor, the general population went to war. So the food surplus, the food supply was affected not only in the US, but not in the US just yet, but in England and Canada and Belgium. And um, uh, Woodrow Wilson set into effect this idea, and the uh, US Department of Agriculture set into motion this idea that you can help the war effort indirectly by planting a garden. And so there's this, uh, tons of Victory Garden posters that are out there um, showing how you can help the war effort by growing your own food and relieving the uh, government from having to have this public surplus and they can send all their food rations over to the soldiers. So, I mean, this really is propaganda, but it's also a, um, you know, you get a sense of fashion, you get a sense of what we were eating back then, lots of root vegetables. Um, you can grow at your garden, you get dividends, you get vegetables and a tax write-off. So I wish that was the case now because I'd be, I'd, our whole front yard would be a garden. Um, after World War II, I'm going to back up for a second. I just had this flashback to an um, exhibition I went to up in Rhode Island uh, <clears throat> a couple years ago, and it was a cocktail, cocktail culture, cocktail couture exhibition, and it spoke to the evolution of clothing, cocktail, and uh, serving vessels um, as the decades changed in response to social change, and the clothing and the and the food serving trays between World War II were gray and drab, kind of dreary and plain, into the 50s where they went into these giant pink cocktail dresses and big frou-frou cooking uh, serving trays. Basically says it all about that very quick transition from World War II into the mid-century style of dining. Suddenly you have processed foods, you have canned foods, and then you have Andy Warhol who takes your everyday, this is for you, Chet, 
Um, picture every day um, object, whether it's a food object or just something from the house. And the quote is, Andy Warhol beatified the ordinary and rendered the sensational banal through repetition. So when you think of Campbell's soup cans, I think of Andy Warhol always. Uh, when I think of just, you know, silkscreen bananas, I think of Andy Warhol. He basically put your everyday, unexpected, unassuming uh, kitchen item on display, and suddenly it's iconic. So that was for you. <laughs> anyway, Andy Warhol and his food. And finally, and I'm going to wrap this up here. I wanted to sort of come back into the contemporary idea of food and art. Um, and now with Instagram and you know cell phones and uh, just Facebook and Twitter, we all fancy ourselves a food stylist. Now, who hasn't taken pictures of their food and posted it? No. <laughs> okay, maybe a few of you. But I swear, I think our meals, my husband's over here, I think our meals have been documented for like the last three years on somewhere out there. But, but here's where it flips, where food becomes the art itself. Um, there is a, um, I don't want to say a school, but there's a program up near Cleveland, uh, the Chef's Garden. It is a uh, chef, Farmer Lee Jones, who actually provides year-round produce, super beautiful, high-end, all sorts of great produce to restaurants all around the world. And he has seminars on all sorts of things, including the art of plating. So you can go there and learn how to plate your food like a pro. Um, and the hashtag, his hashtag on everything is the art of plating. And I, would, I really want to go through that program someday because I need to take more pictures of my food. And anyone who knows me knows that's not true. Um, and if you ever go to uh, Chicago, Elenia, Grant Askett's amazing modernist cuisine, to my mind, channels, I want to say Cezanne in a way, and Ernest Hemingway in a way, where he deconstructs everything into these very simple, um, artistic patterns, but all the food comes together in some glorious modernist um, piece of artwork. And this is dessert. They basically lay the dessert out on the table, come out, you know, put all the chocolate sauce and whatever else is going down, and crumbs of this, and uh, like uh, little uh, liquid nitrogen beads of that. And then you basically just take your spoon and you eat it off the plate, off the uh, tablecloth, and you just mix it all together. And it really is like you're eating art off the table. Um, and he has a very, like he has a training program that he puts his uh, staff through, so they know how to uh, plate, plate, table certain things, while he comes out and puts the finishing touches on them. But I've not been here yet. I know several people who have and said. You know, it's worth all $400 that you pay for dinner. So, maybe for my birthday. <laughs> he's shaking his head, he's like, no way. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, finally, I wanted to show this because you go from the super high-end, control freak, crazy, planned dinner and meal and dessert to Chef Jacques Lemaire. And anyone who knows French knows Le Mer. It means jack shit, basically. So Chef Jack the Shit or Jack Shit is taking the lowest end ingredients, Pop-Tarts, Jolly Ranchers. Um, he has these uh, hot dogs, uh, these uh, corn dogs on a stick. And he also has honey ham rosettes and mustard teardrops. So he's taking these like really just basic processed, not fancy foods and plating them beautifully. And if you look, if you go, actually if you go to the website, he has a whole series of these and they are, they are so creative and beautiful and makes me want to eat a Pop-Tart. So, or maybe not a corn dog on a stick, but, um, so yeah, it just it shows how like beauty really is in the eye of the eater. You know, if you like Pop-Tarts, this is, you know, this is your high-end version. And then finally, 
the images that I wanted to leave you on were completely added just a few days ago. Um, I saw this uh, painting that's around the corner, Sal Sally Tharp's Blueberry Juice, and I love how just silky and drippy and waxy it looks, and decided, or, or it just, it struck me that I saw this Ex this article about an exhibition that is currently going on out in um, San Francisco. And I hope you guys can see this because I really want you to see this on my laptop. Um, Blake Little is the artist, and he more or less douses his, art or his models in honey. He really douses them to a point where they take on this beautiful, waxy, sculptural uh, quality. And the underlying, I guess, philosophy behind this is that he's taking all these different body types, things, people that you might have preconceived ideas about uh, beauty or not, um, and, and honey becomes the great equalizer. So he's, you start looking them at them more as sculpture and kind of losing perhaps your preconceived judgment about them, and I think they're just glorious. And, and there, again, if you look at Blake Little's website, he has a whole series of these photos, and they're beautiful. And the Sally Tharp uh, blueberry juice reminded me of this, so I added this. So I figured I would leave you with images of naked people covered in honey. <laughs> um, and that is the end. <laughs> Um, the artistry again, as I said, of Julia Boyd and Elena. So, thank you for.